In this lecture, we're going to be continuing on with chapter 23, covering sections 5 and 6. Um, so first thing we want to do is uh, look at Gauss's law and Coulomb's law. And it turns out that you can actually derive Coulomb's law from Gauss's law. Um, so the figure here shows that a positive charge Q around, uh, around which a concentric uh, spherical Gaussian surface of radius R is drawn divide us into differential elements dA. So that's what's shown here. We have a, a sphere. Uh, we're just going to divide it into this little differential element. Uh, the area vector dA at any point is going to be perpendicular to the surface because it's always going to be facing outwards. Uh, from the symmetry of the situation at any point, um, the, uh, excuse me, from the symmetry of the situation, at any point, the electric field E is also going to be perpendicular to the surface because right? you have the uh, electric field coming from a positive charge in the center, and it's always going to be going straight outward. So it'll also be uh, perpendicular with the surface of the sphere. Therefore, the angle between E and dA is going to be zero. Um, so, it's, uh, so Gauss's law is just going to simplify um, to E times dA. Um, so we look at our equation for Gauss's law, epsilon naught times the integral of E dot dA is epsilon naught times the integral of E dA. So we get rid of the dot. Um, and that's equal to the enclosed charge, as Gauss's law tells us. All right, and we can start simplifying this integral. So epsilon naught Oops. times e uh, is going to be the integral dA, which is equal to Q. And the integral of dA is just going to be A, or the area. The area of a sphere is uh, 4 pi r squared. So this is just going to be epsilon naught times e times 4 pi r squared is equal to our charge Q. Now if I take this equation and I rearrange it for E, I'm going to divide epsilon naught, divide four, uh, 4 pi r squared uh, over to the other side, and you end up with 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught Q over r squared. And if we look at this, that is exactly Coulomb's law. So this derivation is going to be important. Okay. Um, a charged isolated conductor. Okay, so um, if, it, if the, an excess charge is placed on an isolated conductor, that amount of charge will move entirely to the surface of the conductor. Now the excess charge will be found within the body of the conductor. All right, so let's look at this a little bit closer. Over here you have um, just an oddly shaped conductor. And what they did was they put a Gaussian uh, surface right inside of the conductor. So this black line inside of the conductor is our Gaussian surface. Um, the electric field inside of this conductor must be zero. Right? Because if it wasn't zero, um, then it would exert forces on the electrons inside of the conductor, and you would have a current. Um, and in an isolated conductor, there is no current. So um, inside, we would um, the electric field needs to be needs to be zero. Um, so since the excess charge is not inside the Gaussian surface, um, then it must be outside the, that surface, which means it must lie on the actual surface of the conductor right around here. Now, what if we... Um, the next figure shows that the same hanging conductor, but it now has a cavity that is totally within the conductor. Uh, now, a Gaussian surface is drawn sorry, of the cavity clo uh, close to its surface, but inside the actual conducting body. So again, we have this Gaussian surface in black here shown. All right, so through this Gaussian surface, we know that there can be no flux because we said that there's no electric field um, inside of the conductor. So even if we take a little bit out, there's still not going to be any um, electric field. Therefore, through the surface, there can be no flux, which means if there's no flux, there's no enclosed charge. So since there's no enclosed charge, we know that all of that excess charge 
must still be going to the outer surface out here. Okay. So the electric field just outside the surface of a conductor is actually easy to determine using Gauss's law. So if we zoom in on a portion of the conductor and we assume that it, it we're, we're zoomed in so far that the surface is actually flat. Um, even if it's slightly curved, zoom in far enough, it's pretty much flat. Um, so if we, if we uh, consider the section of a surface, again, that's small enough to neglect any curvature, um, a tiny cylindrical Gaussian surface is embedded in the section, as is shown. So if we put a tiny cylindrical Gaussian surface where part, uh, one end of the cylinder is going to be inside of the conductor, one end of the cylinder is going to be outside of the conductor. Um, the electric field E at and just outside of the conductor surface must also be perpendicular to the surface, right? So if you have this electric field coming out of the surface, it's going to be perpendicular. Also, the area vector is going to be perpendicular. Right, so again, uh, we're going to assume that the cosine of theta when we do our dot product um, is just going to be 1 because the angle between the electric field and the area vector is going to be 0. Um, so we assume that uh, the cap area A is small enough that the field magnitude E in, uh, is constant over the cap. So this sphere that we, or this um, cylinder that we created, we're just going to assume that E is constant since it's so small. Um, then the flux through the cap is just going to be EA, and that is the net flux through the Gaussian surface. Um, the charge Q enclosed by the Gaussian surface lies on the conductor's surface in an area A. All right, so this enclosed charge, which you can kind of see right here, um, is going to be lying on the surface of the conductor, like we said, where we'd expect it to be. And it's going to be enclosed in area A, which is just the cross-sectional area of the cylinder. Uh, now sigma, that symbol there, is the charge per unit area, then the enclosed charge is going to be equal to sigma times A. All right, so what they're showing down here is they took uh, Gauss's law. So we have the integral of E dot dA times epsilon naught is going to be the enclosed charge. And we said that <clears throat> since the cosine um, of zero is just one, this is just going to end up being E, e times A and take the integral, you just get A. Okay. Now, we're going to say that's equal to our enclosed charge, which is just sigma, which is our charge density times the area, because sigma is charge over the area. Okay. All right, so that is shown here. And now if you look at this, you can just cancel out the A's, and you actually get a pretty simple equation for what the electric field is just outside of a conducting surface. It's just going to be sigma, which is our charge density, uh, divided by epsilon naught. All right, so let's do an example. So the figure shows a cross section of a spherical metal shell of inner radius r, uh, and a point charge of negative five microcoulombs is located at a distance of r over two from the center of the shell. All right, so you have the total distance here is going to be r, and you have our charge that's r over 2 away from the center. If this was our center right here. Now, if the shell is electrically neutral, which means it's not charged, what are the induced charges on its inner and outer surfaces? Are those charges uniformly distributed? And what is the field pattern inside and outside of the shell? All right. All right, so the negative, again, negative point charge is going to be located within the spherical metal shell that is electrically neutral. As a result, positive charge is going to be non-uniformly distributed on the inner wall of the shell. So if you look at our chart here, if you draw the electric field lines, um, they're going to be going towards the negative charge, and they're going to be denser when they're closer uh, when you're looking at the, the surface that's closer to the charge and further away from when you look at the surface further away from the charge. All right, so you can just draw like little charges and they're gonna kind of bunch up close to the charge as we would expect and they're gonna be a little further away as we get um, away from the charge. All right, so let's look at the, the reasoning here. So with a point charge of negative five nano, or, 
<clears throat> excuse me, microcoulombs within the shell, a charge of positive 5 microcoulombs must lie on the inner wall of the shell in order um, that the net charge enclosed is going to be zero. Right, because from the previous slide we said that if you have a Gaussian surface shown here in the red inside of an enclosed conductor, the net charge that enclosed must be zero because there's no electric field inside of it. All right, so we would expect that if you have an actual charge of negative five uh, microcoulombs, that there must be an equal and opposite charge that's induced around the inner surface of, of the conductor. Um, Okay, so if the, if the point charge is centered, this positive charge would be uniformly distributed along the inner wall. Um, but since it's not, um, since it's a little bit off-center, this distribution of positive charge is skewed. Because the positive charge tends to collect on the section of the inner wall nearest the negative point charge. Right? So it's collecting over here, like we said. Now, because the shell is electrically neutral, its inner wall can have a charge of positive 5 microcoulombs only if the electrons with a total charge of negative 5 microcoulombs leave the inner wall and they move towards the outer wall. Again, so if you have a positive charge that's on the inner wall, that means the electrons are leaving that area and they're moving to the outer wall um, where that under or where the excess charge is supposed to collect um, with the same magnitude. Uh, all right, so there will be a spread out, so there they will be spread out uniformly, um, as is also suggested by the picture. This distribution of negative charge is uniform because the shell is spherical, and because the skewed distribution of positive charge on the inner wall cannot produce an electric field in the shell to affect the distribution of charge on the outer wall. So basically this distribution of charge in the inner wall is not going to have any effect on what's going on on the outside of the wall because it can't produce an electric field. So once you get this chart, this negative charge on the outside of the wall, we would expect it to all spread out and get as far away from each other as possible. So you get this even distribution of, of charge. Um, the negative charge, or excuse me, the field lines inside and outside the shell are shown approximately. So they're showing the field lines here. All the field lines intersected uh, excuse me, intersect the shell and the point charge perpendicularly uh, inside, the sh inside the shell. The pattern of field lines is skewed because of the skew of the positive charge distribution. So we get this um, kind of shape there. Now outside the shell, the pattern is the same as if the point charge were centered um, and the shell were missing. In fact, this would be true no matter where inside the shell the point charge happened to be located. So what that's saying is you could put this point charge anywhere inside of this uh, gap here, and it's not going to affect the electric field lines of the outer shell. All right, that is it for this lecture. Um, we're going to finish up chapter 23 in the next one.